being said, I would love to introduce our host and our interviewer for the evening, John Sheehy, which I know many of you, if you've been to reunions um, or if you've been around for the last however many years, you know John. John's a graduate of, um, with an English major, the class of 82. He's a historian and a magazine publisher. He has published books such as Comrades of the Quest, an oral history of Reed College, which was issued in conjunction with the college's centennial in 2011. He's conducted countless oral histories over the years that can be found in the Reed archives. He's also been a stellar volunteer who's served on Reed's alumni board. He's been the president before, and he's also uh, been a part of the alumni fundraising for Reed committee. He's produced three themed alumni reunions on calligraphy and creative writing and the humanities. He's served as an advisor to the Reed magazine, and he's a recipient of our Babson Volunteer Society Award. Uh, he and his wife, Lori, live in California, where I know it's very smoky, uh, and I'm thankful that you're able to be here, uh, and is a fourth generation native. So John, thank you so much for being here and volunteering to interview uh, Sam from Arts tonight, and I leave it to you. Thank you. And you're muted. Oh, I'm going to make sure that you can unmute yourself. There you go. Great. Thank you, Olga. That's more intel on me than I, I thought Reed knew. Um, well, welcome everyone to Reed Remote Talks this evening. Uh, COVID-19 has certainly upended all aspects of life as we know it, including the food chain that all of us depend upon. And tonight we're going to be talking with Sam on that very subject. Sam is the editor-in-chief of FERN, which is an acronym for the Food and Environment Reporting Network. It's a nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C., where Sam also lives. Um, and it's been at the forefront of food journalism, as it's called, for the past decade. Uh, Sam is a member of the class of 1980 at Reed. He's also a second generation Reedy. I think you call those people orgies. Is that right, I think? Um, his mother graduated back in 1951. And he received his master's from the University of Chicago and then worked for years as a journalist for Reuters before going out as a freelance business journalist for a number of prominent publications. In 2011, he co-founded Fern, which focuses on high impact investigative and explanatory journalism in the fields of food, agriculture, and environmental health. Now, Fern operates on what is called a studio model, and I think Sam will tell us a little bit what that is, um, but basically he, they partner with a number of media outlets including the Washington Post, the New Yorker, the Atlantic, NPR, ABC, and Mother Jones, among many others. Their investigative reporting has won numerous awards, including three James Beard Awards, the Oscars, as they're known, of food media, named, of course, for Reed's second most famous dropout, James Beard, class of 24. In the last two years, Fern has evolved into what Sam calls accountability journalism. Uh, which has played a big role in what we'll be talking about this evening in terms of their coverage of COVID-19 and its impact on the food chain, in particular at meat packing plants, food processing facilities, and farms. And so with that, welcome Sam. Well, it's great to be here and uh, thank you, John, for that, for that intro. Certainly. Well, why don't we start, uh, tell us a little bit about what food journalism entails. Certainly it's not about recipes or dining out and perhaps how you got into the field as a business journalist and and then help me uh, with this term accountability journalism if you would. Yeah um, so I think most people would uh, you know a decade ago would think of food journalism as chef profiles and, and recipes um, you know uh, uh, reviews of restaurants that kind of thing and I think uh, really starting with Eric Schlosser's Fast Food Nation and, and Michael Pollan's Omnivore's Dilemma, um, food writing really started to shift in, uh, as, as journalists began looking into how food was produced and what the implications of that are. And, you know, when, when you think about the, a food story, when I think about a food story, I mean, it could, it could encompass, encompass anything from um, you know, science journalism 
to cultural affairs, to race issues, to labor issues, um, really the whole gamut of, of, um, of society and the way it impacts um, how food is produced and, and what we eat. So it's really a pretty, you know, we, we talk about ourselves as food, agriculture, and environmental health. And when you, when you unpack that, it could really, you know, it encompasses, uh, uh, you know, everything from climate change stories to, to labor stories, to stories about oceans and biodiversity. So it's really a wide, a wide palette in it, which is great. It's kind of like the typical read thing, right? You just, you just do what interests you. <laughs> <laughs> and so how, help me understand investigative journalism i think we all all know how do you define accountability journalism as different from investigative journalism um well i think investigative journalism is is really anytime you sort of dig into a topic you know with with um you know with, with meat and you really go deep into it um you know it's the difference between writing a you know, a, a 4,000, you know, word story versus an 800 word story that's typically in the newspapers, which can really only touch on, on various issues. Um, you know, obviously news is, is really valuable, but, but at times it, it leaves a lot of questions um, to be answered. I think, you know, as a subset of investigative journalism, account accountability journalism really is about holding institutions and people accountable. I mean, we're seeing that, you know, obviously uh, a lot now uh, with uh, what's going on politically, but it's really in, in, in just about, um, you know, every, every sphere of, of um, you know, business industry, especially, and from my point of view, industries that have an environmental impact. So, um, you know, it's about, you know, are companies living up to what they say they're doing? Are they... You know, are they hiding what they're actually doing? And how do you get to that information to essentially hold these institutions accountable? So, um, you know, I think, I think in investigative journalism has, has always had that strand to it. I mean, going back, you know, it's a century or more. Um, but, um, you know, I think they're different at, at different times. It, it has, you know, it sort of carries carries more importance, and and I think we're in one of those moments. Uh, you know, not not only politically, but also with regard to just in the past year with COVID. Um, mm -hmm. In in our particular area, we've we've seen it a, a lot where um, what companies are doing don't really match what they're saying, and you know, we've found many instances of that where that we try and point out and, and bring, bring these issues to light and hopefully help correct them. Well, I'm thinking, you know, uh, as I'm reading pieces from Fern and whatnot, I, I'm recalling the tradition of the muckrakers from the turn of the 20th century. And I, I assume you see yourselves in that tradition and specifically yeah. thinking today about Upton Sinclair and his groundbreaking novel, The Jungle, right, which disclosed a lot of the harsh conditions Exploit the lives of immigrants, then working in the meatpacking industry in Chicago. Um, and his accountability journalism at the time, his muckraking, led, of course, to reforms like the Meat Inspection Act. Um, do you see yourselves in that, in those footsteps? I mean, does accountability journalism have an expectation that reforms will come out of this type of reporting? Um, I mean, I think ideally, if you see something wrong, you would, you, you know, and you're pointing it out, you you would hope that it gets corrected. But, you know, whether it gets corrected is not is not our our job. We we like to say we're we're catalysts, we're not activists. So it's up to others to kind of take our work um, and use it, you know, in the way that they, um, you know, in a way that they can to maybe advance their cause. But you know. Or maybe it's just informing the public, or maybe it's just changing someone's mind about an issue, or you know, or informing people. It's really you don't really know what the impact is going to be of what you put out there. I mean, sometimes it's you know you think you have something explosive and it is explosive. Um, other times you think you have something that is explosive and it just drops dead. 
and other times you have something that you think is interesting and it becomes in the once you put it out it it does become explosive so right. it's really it's not always it's it's not it's not always predictable you know what what the what the impact is going to be I'm thinking um, back to Upton Sinclair. I mean, obviously he was an activist. He wanted to spark a social revolution. Uh, and I remember a famous comment he made after the public reaction to his book, which was, I aimed at the public's heart and by accident, I hit it in the stomach. Right. <laughs> and <clears throat> this is some of his disappointment that even though he sponsored or he, he was a catalyst about the Meat Inspection Act and the reforms, he found that readers were more interested in their own personal health related to the food chain rather than a, a massive reform effort necessarily that would obviously uh, take on the capitalist system. Uh, do you have a sense of who your readers are at Fern? Are they more people of the stomach or are they people of the heart uh, and mind? Well, this, this kind of gets into our model um, because we really go after many different audiences. So, um, you know, as opposed to a publication that is building its own audience, uh, what we do is we develop content in kind of a, as you, as you said, in a studio model. In other words, we come up with ideas or we work with writers or producers on ideas and we bring out two media partners to see if they want to develop the idea and, and distribute it. Um, and so each of those outlets can have you know, very different audiences, whether it's, you know, the Nation Magazine or Mother Jones, which are, you know, on the progressive, you know, side of the spectrum to, you know, a news outlet like NPR or, you know, or the Washington Post or even, you know, a magazine like Scientific American. Um, mm -hmm. We've even done, done stuff with Vogue Magazine. So it's really, you know, those are all really distinct um, audiences and it influences the way that we shape the content and it also, uh, you know, who we take a story to, um, you know, it depends on what that, what that story is. Um, we also, in, in some cases, we also um, publish stories on our own on our website, but um, we always knew that it would be, uh, you know, far too expensive, capital intensive to really build an audience and we're like a we're like a seven person operation with that depends on freelancers to to to, to create our content so it's a very lean model and um it's not it it's it's not doesn't have the kind of backing that would as a nonprofit that would be able to generate you know huge traffic to sort of justify just creating our own our own um distribution so right. we rely on others to to distribute which means we we you know get all these different audiences whether they're like intense sort of policy makers who need to know you know um sort of the latest developments or whether it's a broader you know a broader a much broader audience like an npr audience you know these are all different things you consider in when you're shaping the story right well i want to dive into some of these stories um that you've exposed especially this year but uh, before we do that, I, I want to ask a little bit about where the inspiration for, for starting Firm came from. And just listening to you talk about working with all these different media outlets, I would imagine your experience as a freelance journalist probably played into that because you know what each one of these outlets are looking for and, and what their audiences are like. So, so where was the seed planted, uh, so to speak, for Firm? Um. Yeah, well, as you as you mentioned, I was a I was a business journalist um, primarily in in the eighties and and nineties, and um, but I got interested in food just because I, I don't know that was kind of what was what was it, it was my interest and it was also growing as kind of a you know um, I think as as a topic sort of culturally, um, and I sort of merged those interests in in my first book, which I'll put up, which was Organic Inc which looked at um, sort of the, the evolution of that industry from, an, from a kind of I idealistic idea really rooted in the 20s and 30s and growing uh, into the, the industry it's become. And, um, you know, and the, the tensions organic, within the that. The big organic industry, essentially, as they call it. Yeah, the big organic and, and sort of the, 
the, the tensions which really go back to its founding between sort of the idealists who are really trying to create a, a more holistic and pure vision of, of, of farming and food and those who were really, you know, um, saw that as a, as a business opportunity. And it sort of took both to create um, what organic is today and they were in tension from the beginning and they're still in tension today. Um, you know, what, uh, 15 years after I wrote that book and <laughs> including some of the same people. So, um, uh, so that really launched me into the food area. Um, you know, again, one step removed from, from my business background. And I think it also sort of, um, uh, you know, um, I sort of woke up to, or, or realized, you know, all the different questions that were, were involved in, in food and in food production. And so those, you know, led to more stories as, as a freelancer. Um, and I had a pretty good freelance career. I think the early 2000s, um, you know, later all the way to, to 2009 or so uh, in the last recession, it was a pretty good, it was a pretty good run. You could make a decent living as a freelancer, or at least I could. Um, and, um, but, uh, there was a moment, uh, and actually you, you play into the story, so you know this, there was a moment where um, literally in, in, the, in December of 2009, or I guess it was eight, 2008, that my work, uh, I, I had sort of some steady jobs and they just, within, within two weeks, I was getting sort of, you know, furlough note or, you know, I, we don't need your work anymore kind of thing. This so, is when the recession of 2008 hit, essentially, in the fall. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it completely evaporated, and it was a pretty scary time, um, similar to what a lot of people are going through now. Right. Um, and so I immediately started sending out emails to every editor I knew, including one who was working with John, um, who was a mutual friend uh, in a startup magazine. And um, I got a, I got a, a gig that was tied to my my sort of separate hobby as a as a as an avid bread maker and which launched me into a story for that magazine for afar and which which grew into my second book which is here so um so that I just like of... to, I just like to interject here that when the editor we were launching this magazine called afar which was about experiential travel she brought me this story idea and pitched it from Sam. I didn't, she didn't tell me who was pitching it, who had pitched the oh, idea. Okay, I thought know. it was a crazy wild ass idea to send so, somebody to Paris to bake for a week with a bunch of artisanal bakers. Uh, yeah, in Paris, the, France. Idea, the, the idea was to, to, to perfect the baguette. The baguette, <laughs> yes. And, uh, but you know, I signed off on it and uh, Sam turned in a great story and it set the model for our whole magazine uh, going forward from the launch, so kudos yeah, to you on and, that one. Yeah, and and it was it, from my point of view, it was interesting because here was a startup magazine in the depths of a recession, sending me to Paris to do a story, and I was there was like three people on the plane. <laughs> so again, kind of like now. So Once uh, again, crazy readies. That's all I can say. Okay, <laughs> so. The book launches, and you're in the. Is the book out by the time Fern comes about? Oh, or? No, so this is an important point. So around that same time, a lot of journalists that I knew were in a similar position to me. They were either losing their freelance work, or they were being cut from publications. You know, at that time, I like to say, the only ones to be cut before the environmental journalists were like the book critics. So. Um, you know, that was that was kind of the situation. And I was invited to a meeting of um, of a foundation, um, which brought, brought a bunch of writers together. Um, and I think they just wanted to pick our brain. But being writers, um, there was actually a couple other readies there, um, or at least one other. And we um, uh, you know, after after the conference, we would sit outside and it was at a kind of a nice hotel in Arizona and we were drinking beers and we were saying, you know, there's all these foundation people here. Some, you know, there should be some sort of model to sort of help 
journalism because what's broken is that publications can't pay for journalists anymore. And we have all of these really talented people, you know, many who were sitting around me at that meeting who couldn't, who couldn't find work. And so, um, you know, the media model was, was clearly broken. And it was that, that sort of base idea that started a few of us, you know, in kind of trying to launch what became Fern. Um, but I, I mentioned that because I was simultaneously working on my book, which was good. I had a book advance and it could kind of keep me going. And we worked on Fern sort of sporadically for two years without any pay. And it wasn't, we got an initial $10,000 planning grant. And then maybe a year later, we got our first real money and we were kind of off to the races. So we launched in 2011. And since that time, you've gained quite a reputation in the field, um, certainly with the partners you've worked with. So why don't you bring us up to date to uh, 2020 now, and it's the beginning of the pandemic outbreak. And Fern is at the forefront of tracking COVID-19 into the food chain. How did you pick up those early signs on the radar that other media outlets weren't focusing on? I mean, is that part of what you do? And what was the big, first big story that you guys cracked? Yeah, so uh, let me go back a little bit because um, there's a couple of important, I think, points that need to be made. And one was when we started, nobody knew who Fern was. So I was essentially trading on my reputation with editors to say, will you work with us? And, um, and I thought our, you know, our model was, you know, we had some foundation money, we can help pay for stories. And I thought that would be a real attraction to media companies. You know, oh, they don't have, they don't have to front the whole expense for a story anymore. Um, we'll help pay for travel, we'll help pay for photos, you know, um, all these different expenses that publications have. And, and um, but, but as it turned out, what they really needed was our expertise, simply because all these editors were being cut. And so they knew like maybe they wanted to do a food story or they you know, were aware of something, but they didn't know who the writers are, were, they didn't really know, you know how to, do, you know, they didn't have the time to develop the idea and essentially they could outsource that to us for, for free. So it was, that became, our expertise became our, um, you know, what was, um, what was really valued. So, you know, we built this reputation, you know, it took, many, you know, many, many years, we had some, you know, early, early good partners. And it wasn't until really say the past, I'd say three or four years that people would start coming to us and saying, can you work with us? So that was like, that was like a big switch. So we knew people were, were looking at us. At the same time, we have this daily, what I call a, a daily policy, um, uh, um subscription site and it basically goes to policymakers um ng people at ngos um researchers you know who sort of need to know the latest thing and we're always feeding news into that daily publication which is mostly focused on washington so to get back to your question we began to notice in in either trade or small publications that um, there were cases of COVID at meatpacking plants. And this was probably in late February, early March that we first noticed it. And, um, and so we had a meeting and um, I said, well, what if we, why don't we just, why don't we track these and like do a spreadsheet? Um, and maybe we can figure out some way to map it. And so one of our reporters, Leah, Leah Douglas, who had never done um, data journalism, basically within a week um, had created a spreadsheet, which we quickly realized that there were a lot of these outbreaks all over the country, mostly reported in very small, you know, in small news sites or news, local newspapers. And within, you know, within another week, she had had an initial map where she started mapping um, these outbreaks. And 
she was getting so many reports that she had to essentially update it daily. Um, and these were reports of either number of cases reported uh, associated with a meatpacking plant and, and soon thereafter deaths that were reported. And so, um, uh, you know, so we have all, uh, also in that newsletter and on our social media feeds, a lot of media follows us. So media were immediately aware of what we were doing and nobody, nobody else, there was one other organization that was doing it, but not really to the depth that we were, uh, you know, started citing us. And that sort of took, took on a life of its own. And, and, you know, you always, you always want, again, a read value. You just want people who like teach themselves. And Leah was one of these people um, who just, essentially within a month taught herself data journalism. I mean, we sent, sent her to like a data journalism workshops, et cetera. But she did a number of these um, um, maps and different, uh, which I'll show in a minute, um, you know, uh, of, the, of the impact of COVID. At the same time, our like, our core competency has always been like doing these in-depth investigative stories. And we had a reporter, um, uh, who was uh, in Colorado and there was a big outbreak in the Greeley plant, which is, um, I think it's about 90 minutes north of Denver and it's owned by JBS, which is um, the largest or one of the largest or the largest meat packer in the world, um, global. And um, a, local, a local newspaper in Greeley had reported on somebody coming down with COVID and, and immediately there was, there was, uh, you know, reports of, you know, lack of PPE for workers, um, you know, et cetera. And so we, this reporter, um, Esther Honig, she teamed up um, with another reporter of ours, Ted Genoways, who was based in um, uh, Nebraska. And they started reporting out on the meatpacking plants, talking to the workers themselves. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, we got a level of detail, although there were, there were reports by then in the national media that there were these outbreaks there. This was kind of the first in-depth story that really got inside the plant itself and got the workers' stories. And I mean, just horrendous things like there was no soap at the hand washing stations, um, you know, there was no, there was no masks initially. People were being, you know, told to come to work, uh, even if they were exposed. Uh, if they weren't coming to work, it was unclear whether they would get paid. I mean, a, a lot of the, these things have since been um, uh, corrected by the companies to, to a degree. But in those first couple of months, it was, um, it was, it was pretty bad. And, um, and, and, and there were deaths. And I'll, I'll share, can I share the screen now and just, just show it? Tim, so yeah. I know you brought some slides of some of the stories you've covered. We've got about 10 minutes to go through those. Uh, well, one thing yeah, that struck me in your pieces is, uh, COVID aside, your reporting is showing some, some of the highlighted, some of the exploited working conditions and the insufficient safety conditions, regardless of a pandemic or not. Reminds me a lot of yeah. Kevin Sinclair you know, you're, yeah, you're really getting and, into, and, you're getting a window into this at this point. And similar to Sinclair, I mean, you know, you mentioned, you know, you talked about this immigrant workforce of what was it, Irish and Italians. And um, I mean, for the most part now, and I don't, I don't know if how, how aware people are of this, but meatpacking plants are essentially filled with an immigrant uh, labor force. Um, about a quarter are undocumented, so have very little recourse to to complaint. Um, no unions uh, in a lot of these places either, right? Yeah, some are some are unionized, but 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 not all of them. And and then the other the other element, the most recent wave is is refugees. So mm -hmm. you get you know you know in the middle of Kansas and Nebraska, you know you have communities of Somalis and communities you know of. Southeast Asian immigrants, people who, 
you know, it's always the most recent wave who is being brought to work into these, into these plants because the work is, I mean, even before COVID, the, 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 you know, the worker injury rate, it's, it's one of the most dangerous industries. So, uh, you know, the work is hard, you're working in a cold environment. Um, so it's, it's, it's a really, it's a really tough job and prone to, to um, exploitive conditions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think one, one thing that came out in the reporting too was we were getting a really different story from the workers than what the companies were saying. And I think what happened is the companies realized that things were so bad that essentially they stopped reporting cases. And, mm -hmm. and in some cases, the states, um, like Kansas governor, stopped reporting cases in meatpacking plants because they didn't want these numbers out there. Um, I mean, there were stories of, you know, people, you know, uh, and their, their, their justification was, we can't share medical infer, you know, information, but this wasn't, it wasn't medical information about individual people. It was, it was, um, cumulative statistics on, you know, on rates of, of, um, of, of, uh, infections at the plants. And, and once they stopped talking about that, it was very difficult for the workers because then they didn't know how bad it was, or, you know, they had to, or they relied on rumors or, you know, it, it, it became a very dicey situation. And, um, uh, in one, uh, another story we did, which I'll, which I'll also, uh, an audio story with Latino USA and, and NPR, um, you know, in one case, uh, a worker who was not, you know, who was in one of these plants came home, infected his father, uh, who was a Vietnam vet from, from Vietnam, an, an immigrant, and, 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 and died. The guy died because he was exposed to his son, you know, through, by his son. Uh, and, um, you know, it was cases like that of people not knowing what the risk was, um, you know, that really made things especially tough for the workers, you know, and as you recall at that time, um, there were statements such as, you know, if we don't, if we don't keep producing meat, you know, people are going to be in the streets. I mean, th these are, you know, like, this is what the governor of Kansas said. And then at Trump at that moment, um, you know, issued this executive order, which had the effect of, of keeping the plants operating and de declaring, you know, those workers essential. Mm -hmm. So, right. so all the people producing our food in this country now are, you know, farm workers who are in the fields and meatpacking workers, they're all essential workers um, who, many of whom don't have protections because they're undocumented, but they still have to go to work because they're essential. Right. And one of your illuminating articles was a comparison to the meatpacking industry in Europe versus America. And what I'm recalling is one thing that happened is the governments, like in Germany, which is a big meat packer, the government stepped in and took local control away um, from the meat packing plants and whatnot. And so they didn't allow suppression of information uh, at the lower levels. The other point I think your article made is that a lot of those meat packing plants are very small compared to the US. So they were able to shut them down and shift operations without having major impacts to the meat supply, which is a issue in America is because we have these huge meatpacking plants that they can't essentially afford to shut down without uh, impinging upon the meat supply business here. Um, yeah, I mean, that story came about because, I mean, we're like doing all this reporting on, you know, hundreds of plants in the U.S. that have these rising infection rates. And I'm like, well, how come we're not hearing anything from Europe? I mean, are they just like, is it just not getting over here? So we had a report, reporter in the south of France, and I was like, can you like, ask around what, what the hell is going on there? And she started calling unions in, you know, in Germany and um, uh, you know, Spain and Ireland and you know, all over and you know, EU officials. And there were, there were definitely cases. I mean, there, it's not like they avoided the problem, but you know, there was nowhere near the level that happened in this country. And essentially, you know, they attributed to stronger, stronger unions, essentially, you know, in, in Ireland, like 
they walked out and just demanded, you know, higher pay, you know, essentially hazard pay and also PPE. And they didn't go back till they got it and they got it relatively quickly. And ironically, that that plant was also owned by JBS, you know, the same plant in Greeley. Um, you know, and then in Germany, officials, yeah, took the took the reins. Um, very similar problems, though, in Germany, a lot of the workers were from Eastern Europe. They were housed mm -hmm. in dormitories, so they had, you know, these kind of risk factors for how they were housed. But um, but for the most part, they, yeah, they avoided it. And our, our story tried to explain why they avoided it. So, um, you know, I thought that was a pretty important story and a pretty important contrast. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it, it got some attention. I don't know how, how much attention it, it did get. Well, um, we're at the point where I'm going to ask people uh, participating here to submit your questions on chat if you have them now. And maybe, Sam, I know you've got some great visuals. Maybe for five minutes, you can just quickly walk us through the visuals, highlight a few items. Uh, we've talked about a couple of them, I know, while people uh, prepare any questions they might have. Okay, so I'm going to try and share my, share my screen here, so bear, bear with me. Um, Uh, so this is um, this is the story about Greeley, and this was uh, the funeral of the first worker who died uh, there. Um, and it was quite quite moving. It was a quite moving picture, um, and which we got from AP. And uh, um, the story featured, uh, in part, the the story of this worker's family, the picture here. Um, as well as other workers and what they were facing. Um, and this was, as I said, our first really big in-depth story on this topic, which we produced in, in partnership with Mother Jones. Um, and uh, that quote, the workers are being sacrificed is what, what um, which was the headline was from one of the, one of the, one of the people, uh, uh, you know, associated with the plants. Um, Another story which we did quite recently was a was a long form audio piece with Latino USA. And this this is kind of unusual because they do do long form audio, um, but this turned into a thirty minute audio piece, which essentially focused on the children of meat packers in the Midwest, um, who are U.S. citizens, obviously, um, and they started protesting the conditions in the meatpacking plants because their parents were too scared to speak up. And so um, at first, a lot of the parents were discouraging their kids to, to do this, but they, um, they started a pretty, um, in these meatpacking towns, um, they started um, these sort of um, caravans of protests by cars and um, all, all made up of, you know, kids in their late teens, you know, twenties, and and their supporters, and it was it that was also quite a moving story because it it happened completely spontaneously, as a lot of these movements do, and um, kind of took on a life of its own. Um, whoops, hang on, how do I go back? <laughs> Sorry. Um, So this is a this is a map, um, and this is being until till really the past week. It's been updated daily, and those the red bubbles are essentially meatpacking plants with infections, uh, and the um, the bubble shows the relative size of the of the infection. And if you go to our website um, and look at this story mapping COVID nineteen in the food system. Um, You'll you can click on each circle. You can zoom in, you know, on every state. You can also click on each circle and find the details about each plant. Um, one thing that was sort of curious: we're now we're now up to fifty six thousand positive cases, cases, which is certainly an undercount because because companies and states are not and counties are not fully reporting. Um, and two hundred forty one deaths. So this is of like late September, when we did the Greeley story, um, when that came out in May, uh, so like three months ago, three three plus months ago, you know, ago 
there were 20 deaths. So the deaths have gone up tenfold in that time. Um, you'll notice too, there's like nothing in Florida or very little. And actually Florida has been a hotspot. Um, and we did a story on, there's a huge um, uh, produce uh, production in Immokalee, Florida, called the tomato capital of the, of the country. And um, um, there were no, we called the county there and they had no, no reports of any cases. And when we were talking to work for advocates, there were, there were many cases, they just, they weren't being tracked by anyone. So that kind of tells you what's, what's going on here. Um, we did a really interesting data analysis. Again, um, uh, Leah um, partnered with, with another outfit uh, a rural a rural news outlet called the Daily Yonder, um, and they correlated um, cases with rates in counties. And what you see here, just looking at say the non-metro area, uh, a rural county, is that when you have a meatpacking plant with COVID cases, um, they had on average infection rates of of more than a thousand per hundred thousand versus. 209 in counties that did not have meatpacking plants with cases. And so there was a five-fold uh, increase, you know, five-fold difference in, in these rural counties and small metro areas as well. So we began to, you know, one thing we, we that Leah started to do was look at counties with high rates of infections, uh, you know, as well as she could gather, they can get that data. Um, and then look around and see if there was a meatpacking plant in the county or another, another, you know, another factor that might, might explain it. Um, another, I mean, just, you know, we're doing a read thing. Another hot spot is actually in eastern well, Washington with, you know, where all the apple orchards are, that became a, a hot spot as well. Um, this is the story about Europe. Um, and this is outside of a plant in Germany. Um, which immediately started requiring, you know, uh, PPE for all its workers. It was a very different response than the U.S. Sam, it sounds like we can't hear you anymore. Yeah. Your mouth is moving and there's no sound. <laughs> um, there we there go. was a run on, um, uh, there was a run on water. And so there was, um, there was a real Sam, Sam, excuse me, we lost your audio for about a minute. Can you just uh, go back to the start with this? Uh, particular photos about we didn't hear the intro okay can you hear me now yes okay so um, uh, so this was a case of, of some towns in California um, which their water supply is polluted by nitrates which stems from agricultural pollution um, essentially fertilizer seeping into the water supply and making it undrinkable so people have to buy water um, or the state trucks in the water for, for these communities, in many cases, poor communities. And when there was a you know, run on food and during the early days of COVID, there was also a run on water. And so people were scrambling uh, just to buy water in these communities. Um, and now so I sort of want to just talk about different things that we do at FERN. This was a climate change story uh, and also that dealt with the uh, pebble mine in Alaska, which, which was at that point really threatening the biggest uh, wild salmon fishery in the world um, in Bristol Bay. And just recently, actually a couple of days ago, the Trump administration announced that they would not uh, be permitting that mine um, because uh, Trump's son um, made a big campaign about how he likes to fish up there. And as well as uh, Tucker, Car Tucker Carlson had a big campaign too. So after years of pushing for development of this mine, 
once um, once uh, Carlson did this segment and Trump's son weighed in, they nixed the project. Kind of shows how things happen. Sam, I'm wondering if we could stop here because we have a couple of questions that are related to climate change while we're while we're on this topic here. I don't know if you have another slide after this one or. Yeah, I just have one more. I think one more. Okay. Uh, two more. Uh, this was another another story again related in part related to climate change. So these huge dust storms in from from arid conditions in Texas. Um, where there are these huge feedlots that hold, you know, 50,000 plus animals. Um, and you get these massive dust storms, which are essentially fecal dust storms um, yes. that the local communities are um, worried about. Um, it's another kind of accountability, local, sort of a local journalism accountability story. And then finally, we also do food security stories. This one was about um, college students who couldn't afford food and couldn't afford um, housing and um, and how uh, there's different programs to give kids food, essentially food scholarships. I know Reed actually had a had a plea at one, uh, this spring for for help for some of its its students as well in this regard. So I'll, st I'll stop there. Great. Well, I think we have two related questions uh, to pose to you. Um, both about climate change uh, on this topic. Um, the first one from Joe Cloud. How are you looking at reporting at the intersection of agriculture and climate change? I see a lot of activism pushing veganism uh, as a solution for climate change. What is Fern's report reporting turning up in terms of ideas for changes in the food system and climate issues? And a related question from Hillary Barber, just throw this in, seems like COVID-19 has exposed and are forced to the surface the vulnerability of the global food system that observers have been warning about for some time. Do you feel that people are paying more attention now? Have you noticed an uptick in readership story traction on those topics? Um, well, I'll deal with the second question first. Um, we've definitely seen an uptick. I mean, our, our, our web traffic, um, what has has been up nearly a hundred percent and again we're not a site that sort of promotes <laughs> promotes our website that's not how we how we get our readership so so this these stories definitely are resonating and our, especially our mapping work has been used by a lot of different um, news outlets and um, it's been on the front page of the New York Times it's been you know in every major network and in multiple places overseas as well so I think, you know, these issues are resonating. Um, having written about food for as long as I have, I kind of, you know, you know, thinking about what, what John was saying about Sinclair, that the way to people, you know, is through their stomachs. And I think, I think there is sort of an element of like, how, it, how does it affect me? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, in part that was, I, I think, came up in, in COVID in terms of, you know, the supply chain, could I get stuff? Um, and I think there is more awareness, especially among younger people about these issues. Um, um, whether it's gonna change, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I would hope so. <laughs> um, segwaying to Joe's question, um, I mean, the ag agriculture system, agriculture is a huge part of the climate change problem. I mean, it, it accounts for agriculture as a whole, accounts for about a quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions. And if you factor in clearing of forests to expand um, production of, of crops and, and livestock, the total is estimated to be around a third. So um, we've been actually pushing that story um, of trying to build awareness about the impact of agriculture on uh, climate change and, um, and different, uh, you know, different efforts uh, underway to, to try and mitigate it. Um, there's, you know, things known as um, carbon farming where you're trying to build carbon in the soil and, and it is, it's quite hot in sort of sustainability circles, but there, 
we did a question, a story that sort of questioned a lot of the science behind it and how solid it was. <coughs> um, and as for meat, um, I mean, I think uh, it's indisputable that meat is a contributor to, to greenhouse gas emissions and livestock production. Um, and there may be ways to produce meat that, um, um, you know, mitigate those effects. And there have been, I've seen some studies uh, to that effect. But when you talk about the overall uh, meat system, which is essentially the industrial meat system, um, it, is, it is a greenhouse gas emitter. And I don't think there's, there's any way around that. Um, as for veganism, I mean, it's interesting. One of the things, one of the, we get labeled by the, we, we've gotten pushback from the meat industry and they call us anti-animal activists. Um, that's, that's how they try and frame our reporting. And they do that instead of responding to the particular criticisms um, that we bring up. So, um, you know, that's, that's sort of par for the course. I, you know, I sort of expect industry pushback and, you know, with their talking points and, and with their attempt to, to frame us. But I think they're speaking to a particular audience when they do that. Right. So one other question from uh, Michelle Jenny. How do you think the coverage of COVID-19 and the food production system might have been different in the pre-internet milieu? Would Fern have been one of the many that spearheaded this coverage? I'm wondering if myself, if Fern would even be possible in the pre-internet um, model kind of situation. Well, there were cases of nonprofit, you know, journalism outfits in the pre-internet era. I mean, Mother Jones was a was a good one, and they made a really a remarkable and successful transition to the internet age. Um, uh, you know, others were more were sort of remained more more print bound. Um, well, that's true. and I have to say, I published at Knee Reader in the '90s, and we collected that from the alternative newspapers, which was another great feeder, much like you are on the ground for what was going on. We could identify trends and whatnot and get local reporting that other people didn't access in a sense. Yeah, and a lot of those local publications are gone. I mean, a yeah. lot of them have gone under, I mean, a lot of the alternative press has gone under. Yeah. Um, and um, I mean, we started Fern in, you know, and it's about almost a decade old. And now there's a whole industry of nonprofit journalism outfits. Um, and I don't see any way for the type of journalism we do, um, investigative accountability, environmental journalism, really to go forward without um, charitable support. I mean, we wouldn't exist um, without our individual donors and our foundation donors who are split about half and half. And there's at least, we belong to an association of nonprofit journalism organizations, of which I think there are more than 200 um, at this point. Uh, many of them local news outlets and, and others who focus on so particular subjects like us. Mm -hmm. So I think journalism as a whole is changing. And um, just as a plug for us or anybody else, if you're interested uh, in this kind of work, you know, beyond sort of the big names, you know, the Times, the Post, you know, et cetera, the um, Washington Post, you know, um, it's really outfits like ours and many others that are doing this sort of investigative work uh, that, is, that is being echoed by much larger media organizations. So we're really a key part of that ecosystem, I think. Two really quick questions to close here. One, what keeps you motivated in this work, especially in these trying times? Um, ah, so it's, 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 it's great to be on a, on a big story. <laughs> so it's been really fun. Um, I was really getting worried about our staff getting burned out because we were just, we, we I think through, through June, we did more, we had more volume than we did in all of last year in terms of story production. Um, and 
you know, I know I needed a break. So I, I took a, you know, I took some time off this summer, but you know, it's tough to, to, to take time off. <coughs> um, but, you know, I don't know. I, I love what I do. It's, it's, you get to ask questions. What's better than that? You know, you get to explore your curiosity. Sounds like a reedy. <laughs> um, any predictions or insights about ways in which the food industry might be reformed once this pandemic passes? Uh, do you think we're going to see an Upton Sinclair moment in the 21st century, a, a new meatpacking act or something like that? I, I think a lot of it depends on Congress and, and what happens in the election. Um, there is a movement. Um, a lot of this stems from, what, from, a, from a meat industry that's essentially an olig oligopoly. I mean, you have, you know, a handful of companies which control, you know, the vast majority, over 80% of the meat supply in this country. Um, you had a situation in COVID where meat prices were going up, but the prices that farmers were getting paid went down. So who's in the middle getting that margin? You know, it's the meat companies. They were crying that production had to continue because people would be short of meat. And then the Times reported that in April they had record exports to China of meat. So that's, you know, that's where a lot of meat is going. I, but there is a movement, there's this, this thing that's going on now, which is essentially an anti-monopoly uh, movement. And it's something that even conservative Republican farmers, it's an issue for them um, uh, that, they're, that they are concerned about. And, um, and so you see the current administration, the Justice Department launching anti, you know, some, you know, investigations into the meat industry. And I think it's a sop essentially to Republican farmers. But you also have people like, you know, Elizabeth Warren and Cory Booker on the Hill, you know, um, calling for more action on this issue. And, and, and in the case of Cory Booker citing our, our work in particular. So potentially, I think, I think a monopoly issue could be one that could produce some change. And a related last question from Lynn Griffin. What chance do you see that a significant portion, a proportion of farmers will move to regenerative agriculture in this whole shift, if that happens, if the monopolies are broken up? Well, they might move to it even if monopolies aren't broken up. Um, and, I, and I'll tell you why, because, and this gets back to the story we did on whether carbon farming is, is real or not, because <clears throat> what's happening is that bo on both sides of the aisle, um, there are attempts to come up with a new payment program for farmers. And that payment program would be based on how much carbon they sequester in the soil, which is very difficult to measure as any, as as scientists will tell you. But um, I'm convinced that they will come up with a program um, to shift more money to farmers uh, this way. And they, you know, and it could have a potential impact if it's, if it's done right. And if other, other measures are taking, like protecting wetlands, et cetera. Um, and it'll be, it won't be like extreme regenerative agriculture, which probably involves, you know, um, you know, which probably involves going more in an organic direction. But uh, but there'll be there'll there'll be some measure, and I think if payments are behind it, farmers will do it because, as the saying goes, they always farm for the payment program. So, great. Well, with that. Thank you very much, Sam, this evening for a fascinating encounter and the important work you're doing. Um, definitely the Reed's answer to Upton Sinclair out there. And thank yeah, you all I, for- Yeah, one, one, thing, one thing I did want to add, is, you know, because um, we John and I were talking and, um, and it sort of relates to the, like, how do you keep going? And, um, and essentially I said to John, I was like, I feel like I'm doing exactly what I did at Reed, which is like, I'm, I'm, I'm exploring like a wide range of issues, right? From science to culture, to history, to, you know, contemporary thought, whatever in my work, you know, we're writing about it. 
and we're asking questions and we're being critical. I mean, that's like, you know. So, <laughs> so it's, Reedy right there. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my plug for Reed. <laughs> great. Well, Olga, I'll turn it back to you then. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And I appreciate you bringing it back to Reed. Um, I kept thinking throughout this presentation, like this is classic Reedy stuff. So um, it, I really appreciate working with you both. Thank you for taking the time. You've been really generous. Uh, I won't keep you much longer. I know it's late on the East Coast, Sam. Um, I wanted to just point out that tomorrow I'm going to be sending everyone a little survey to find out what you thought about this talk. I'm sure John and Sam would also love to get your feedback. So please look for that in your inbox. Um, and then if you enjoyed this talk, you know, we in alumni programs are very excited to share uh, the important work of our alumni. And I invite you to join us for upcoming talks. Uh, the next one we're doing is on September 17th and we're gonna be welcoming Acacia Park. She's the class of 03. And she's gonna be talking about how we leverage technology i.e. your smartphone, uh, to deliver mental health therapy to the masses. Uh, you'll see information about her talk as well as other uh, engagement opportunities that we're putting together on the Read Remote website. And I am just going to put that into the chat box right there. So you can check out those as well as our upcoming volunteer weekend. Uh, it'll be virtually this year. We, we call it the Forum for Advancing Read, and that's taking place in mid-October. Um, I wish you all well. Um, especially those of you who are in the wake of Hurricane Laura, devastating wildfires where John is, or cities um, who are experiencing great unrest. Let's take care of ourselves and each other. Please stay safe, and we'll see you soon. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night.